is the uh, podcast for a Monday as we plow towards not only the holiday season, Christmas to be specific, but also through uh, free agency in Major League Baseball. And of course, uh, for the last few weeks, there have been uh, nothing but rumors about a variety of things that may or may not be taking place. And we're here to address at least some of those uh, today with our friend J.P. Uh, Morosi. John Shannon, of course, is along as well. Uh, Morosi, the, let's start right at the beginning here. The Blue Jays have been involved in more rumors this <laughs> offseason than any year I can ever recall. Is it because there is a sense in the media that the Blue Jays are not only willing but able to do a lot of things? Yes, and first of all, Bob and John, always great to be with you, and I appreciate you not beginning with a conversation of the forthcoming football match on uh, Saturday in Columbus. We'll, we'll probably get to that one later. Well, but, uh, if, you're, if, your I, team show, if your team even shows up for it, <laughs> which I doubt, and they'd oh, be wise well, not to, otherwise they're going to get well, their even, ass kicked. Even if they do show up, apparently they don't show up. So, if you know oh, what I mean. Oh, my goodness. I, I, yeah. I'm sorry that I even mentioned it. But uh, I, I, we, we digress, and it's my fault, as it usually is. Uh, but as, as we talk about the Blue Jays, you're right, Bob. There, there is a, a strong sense around the game that the Jays have the wherewithal to spend, um, the ownership support to do it, and also a roster that is positioned for the right amount of additive elements. And by that, I mean when you've got a young position player group, as they have, at reasonable prices, you're able to make some pretty bold decisions. And, and they seem to be a team that in the midst of a lot of economic uncertainty, they seem to have a little stronger sense of who they are, the resources they have relative to a lot of their American competitors right now. So I think it's by and large um, a, a tribute to the way they've built the organization for a number of years now to the point that they're actually poised to spend. And I think one of the other key developments of the off season so far is, is not even a player move at all, but the fact that Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is in better shape. And, and there's a certain belief by the Jays that he may be able to play third base. And if he can do that, it really opens up a lot of possibilities for this team to upgrade at first base if you feel confident that Vladdy can play third base at least for the next couple seasons. Does that mean when they dip into the free agent market, we're, all we're talking about is starting pitching? It could, or maybe they're uh, also aggressive on the on the infield slash first base front. You could certainly also see Rowdy Telez uh, playing over at first. I, I still think there's a possibility to make a move for an outfielder for an extra bat, depending on how the lineup shakes out. Of course, Grichuk is, is locked in out there, as is Guriel. But I, I do think, John, to your point, that starting pitching is the overall priority. Uh, I, I was even told here recently Mike Fires is one name that they've been talking about I think you name him they've looked at him from a starting pitching standpoint and you look at their depth chart overall I agree that they are not yet at the point where the Tampa Bay Rays are even where the Yankees are even as the Yankees look to certainly upgrade their rotation the Jays are not yet at that level and even if you think about the way they ended this past season Taiwan Walker's a free agent Matt Shoemaker's a free agent they, they did bring back Robbie Ray, but this is not a complete rotation, in my opinion. Well, the confusing thing for me, Morosi, is among the rumors that are out there, and I'm, not, I'm just going to go through a few. Uh, there's the possibility of a Francisco Lindor deal. He's a shortstop. George Springer, an outfielder. Uh, Real Muto, a catcher. Bauer, a pitcher. Those are just some of the hot rumors for the Toronto Blue Jays. Um, the confusing part is they're all over the map in terms of position as to what they might be willing to or wanting to upgrade. I agree with you. I mean, but look, you know, when you talk about pitching as being the primary need, you could probably say that for every single team in Major League Baseball every single year. So we, that is a given. But of the other three, which one makes the most sense to you? That's a great question. I, I think that among the free agents, I would love to see them get DJ LeMayhew uh, because he is someone that, first well, of all, you, yeah. take him off of, you take him off of your division rival. Mm -hmm. You could play him at second, and then you probably keep Bo Bichette at short. Uh, I, I think that that's probably what my preference would be of that group. 
But I, I, you, you also have to love George Springer. He's someone who's won a World Series with the Houston Astros. There, there's, there's a, uh, I think, a, a credibility that goes into George Springer. Yes, I understand he was on the 2017 team with, with the asterisk by it, so to speak. But he is someone who I think is, uh, is a winner in the game, who is respected universally across the game, who, who I really believe would, would have a, uh, a real credibility walking in that clubhouse. And, and you now need – the analogy I've drawn here is you need this team's version of Russell Martin. Remember when the Jays signed Russell Martin? They were just about getting good, mm -hmm. and, and they were poised to get really good. Yeah. They needed somebody that had been in the playoffs a number of times to really give them that edge and that credibility. Russell had that. I think George Springer has that. DJ LeMahieu has that. Lindor has that in his own way. And, and I think that to your point, Bob, while you're right that traditional distribution is a little bit scattered there, the thought, I think, is this. We don't really know what this financial market looks like in full. We don't really know how, uh, to what extent fans come back in what numbers when. But if, if you yourself as a club feel pretty sure about your overall revenue streams and your overall business model, you can say, listen, I value this player at this number of years and, and this number of dollars. I am going to, if not offer this to the, to the player's agent, to basically say to that agent, listen, here's about where I evaluate your player. And if you get to the point where you're comfortable at this number, and maybe it's not necessarily as high as they wanted that number to be at the outset, but these are different times. And so if you're comfortable with a certain price point, let the agent know. And then if the agent and the player come back and, and are favorable to it, you got a deal. And I really think that, you know, LeMahieu improves their club. Springer improves their club. Sure. Real Muto does. Bauer does. Lindor does. When, you're, when you've already got a decent foundation for a team, you can be broad in, in the way that you seek the market, especially if you look at your competitors and if they seem to be a little reticent to spend, the competitive advantage now in the, the new market inefficiency, you will, if you will, is spending money. And the Jays appear comfortable doing that. The, the, the short-term issue for the Jays in signing any free agent, though, is where are they going to play? I really, and I, it, listen, it may be only for four or five months, but you know darn well, players think short term, even though the money's long term, players are going to say, well, where are we going to, are we going to play in Buffalo? Because there's no way at this point, I don't believe that, that they will, after, after spring training, that they'll be starting in Toronto. I really, I still don't. I think that that's going to be a major issue and they're going to start the season in Buffalo. And how much of a factor is that as you try to negotiate with a free agent? Well, it is a factor. They may well be able to play in Dunedin this year, and that's where the difference there would have been. Right. Uh, and by and large, I think two key differences between 2020 and 2021 as it relates to Dunedin. Number one, you were talking in 2020 about July, August heat, July, mm -hmm. August rain in, in Florida that time of year is always difficult to manage. Whereas you think about Buffalo in April is a little different situation than Dunedin in April. So I, I think it's from that standpoint of weather, you're probably going to stay in Dunedin if you have to do that a and B the reason that Dunedin was not a great option. The other reason at the time was there was a, a pretty significant spike in, in cases with respect to COVID in Florida at that exact moment. I think that we have to realize that first of all, we don't know what the COVID situation is going to be in April in Florida, mm -hmm. but it, it we can at least be hopeful that it will not be demonstrably worse than what it would be in Buffalo. And you're going to get better weather in Florida at that point in time, which in general, as we've seen in the situation over the last several months, we're often told, Hey, outside's better than inside. If weather's better in Florida than it is in New York at that point in time, it may not be the worst thing to stay in Dunedin. And I, and I do think John, from that standpoint, if you're going to tell, tell your players, listen, We've already got the plan in place to just stay in Dunedin until Toronto is ready. Mm -hmm. And we would all expect you know, by the midsummer, it, that should probably be the case. We would hope. Fingers and so crossed. if that's the case, then, then, then you're moving one time. You're, it's in, so instead yeah, of moving Dunedin to Toronto once in late March, 
you're moving to need a Toronto in late May. And that's, and that's maybe a better option for some players anyway. In defense of Buffalo, it's no different than playing games in April in Detroit or in Cleveland. You know, uh, and, and, and let's face it, the Buffalo experiment for the 60 game schedule, I think overall was a successful experiment for the Blue Jays. I agree. I think that, you know, B- Buffalo overall, the city and the ballpark accounted very well for themselves. Mm-hmm. And, and it was, uh, I think you've got to credit everybody involved from MLB to the people in Buffalo to making that work. So I think you're right. I, I think that overall, though, and we've heard this many times, we've even heard farm directors, player development directors, make decisions early on in the season. If it's a two-month decision for a prospect, they will often say, okay, Florida State League instead of the Midwest League or New Hampshire uh, in the Eastern League for the Jays for many years, to, they'd rather have them stay in the better weather to play. And I think that's the, the general idea of both sure. options are there. Look, um, uh, uh, there's virtually no chance they're going to be playing in Toronto at the beginning of the season. No. And uh, wherever they play, who gives a crap? Um, whether they play in Buffalo or Dunedin. No, I'm just saying, in, Bob, the only in, reason I bring it up, the only, Bob, the only reason I bring it up is I think it's a factor when you're trying to explain to a free agent, here's the puzzle we're going to have to put together until – the pandemic is over. Well, fine, John, but you're, you're That's talking about, point. you're going to sign a guy to a three, five, seven, 22 year contract. And is he going to give a flying for do if the first three months he's playing in Dunedin or Buffalo? I, I'm guessing no. At the end well, of the day, it's going to be about the same thing it is for you and me and Morosi and everybody else that's watching or listening to this. And that is the do re me. I want to get into a little bit of the, of the, 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 the speculations and specifics about some of these players. So the spec is that the Indians would be happy to trade Lindor in exchange for Gurriel Jr., maybe something else. But you got one year left on the contract with Lindor, and the Blue Jays are not going to give up Gurriel for a rental. Or are they, Morosi? I would not expect them to. That's too high a price without getting the extension. Now, if you get the extension, if you say, would you rather have multiple years of Guriel or one year of Lindor? That's that's a tough that's a tough question. But if it's, would you rather have four or five years of Lindor versus four or five years of Guriel? Then you, you take Lindor in that situation. And so yeah. the, the other the other issue for the Jays to work out too is. What are your available options to replace Guriel in the outfield? Right. And that may be why we've seen the Jays linked to a number of different free agents. Well, part of that is if you've got to use a piece to get Lindor, then maybe that free agent is not really fitting your roster now, but he would if there was a trade. So I, I think that's why the Jays have a good situation, okay, because they've got at the at the minor league level a couple – highly regarded young infielders, Austin Martin and Jordan Groshan, so they could make a move with one of them um, without really depleting their overall depth of, of young position players. I mean, the, not all of them can play. So you, you have to make some decisions about who is part of your club and who is not. And uh, they always say, it's true in hockey, true in baseball, you've got to know your own talent. Sure. And the Jays we trust – have a good understanding of who their true core players are and where they can play. And and that's why it's so interesting that Bo Bichette as a second baseman has all of a sudden become a topic. Whereas uh, for a long time, he was definitely going to be the shortstop. And now all of a sudden, eh, maybe not, maybe they'll, maybe they'll play second. Maybe they'll bring in, um, uh, if not a Lindor, maybe it's going to be a D.D. Gregorius. Uh, of course, someone who has experience in the American League East. Maybe it's a Simmons. Uh, there's a lot of different possibilities there. But I, I think, to me, there's a good number of available shortstops to the point that they're of a sufficient quality that you could move Bo Bichette to second, and he would have to be able to understand that. If it's Simmons, obviously one of the great defensive players of his time at the position, uh, someone like Marcus Simeon, who's really emerged. There's, there are a lot of legitimate shortstops out there to the point that I, I think you can make an argument that Bo Bichette serves this team better as a second baseman, or at least his versatility mm-hmm. gives them the option of doing that going forward. 
Well, I, I don't disagree with anything you've, you've said. Um, if you can get Lindor, he's one of the premier uh, players and impact players potentially in the game. Um, if you had to trade Guriel to your point of um, depleting your outfield, that then theoretically opens the door to sign Springer, which would essentially counterbalance your loss with a win. But now you've got two players that you're going to have to pay, I don't know what to, $20 million plus a year. And that impacts your ability to go out and, and get a, um, a, a frontline pitcher, which we all concede is something the organization wants and probably needs. So, and LeMahieu, as far as I'm concerned, I don't know about you, but I, I keep hearing LeMahieu is going to wind up going back to the Yankees. We all know the Yankees have the ability revenue-wise to match any offer if he's not terribly unhappy in, um, in New York. Then LeMay, who's going to go back to the Yankees, yes? I would say so, yes. That's the industry opinion. Uh, I've been told that myself, that DJ would prefer to go back to New York. But I would make this point, and I've actually made this suggestion. You know, DJ is, like me, he is from Michigan and loves hockey. So <laughs> I, I, I've, I've made the point that, uh, first of all, he would have good comfort in Toronto just from a cultural standpoint. And second of all, if, if – uh, if the Jays want to put together a really nice, compelling sales pitch on the great city of Toronto, the person who should make that sales pitch is, uh, is the guy who used to wear the number 14 sweater in Detroit, uh, Mr. Shanahan, because I, that was the vintage of wings teams that I know DJ loved growing up. Actually, I think he's even still a wings season ticket holder. So again, he, DJ knows and loves uh, baseball very, very well. Mm-hmm. If that was Mr. Shanahan picking up the phone and calling DJ, uh, that, that would that would tug on the heartstrings. Well, that, that would almost be like the, the like the John Tavares picture of sleeping on the Maple Leaf uh, bench. Well, here, it's the same same kind of idea. Here's here's what you really have to understand, and this may be a big selling point. Um, the Blue Jays are going to play in Dunedin. Uh, the uh, Raptors are playing in Tampa. Yeah. Um, the Maple Leafs probably may, may very well play in Tampa too. So he can, he can play for the Blue Jays and watch his other, his other favorite teams and sports. Leafs exactly. aren't playing in Tampa. None of them Leafs in Toronto, mind in you. Leafs aren't playing in Tampa, Bob. Just Where are they going to play? Uh, Toronto. They're going to play in Toronto. All right. Whatever. Or they're going to play in other Canadian cities because – Well, that eliminates that them. because he ain't going to be in Toronto for a few months. No, exactly. <laughs> well, well I, I, and, the, the point there is, again, we, we talk a lot about uh, – from a geographic standpoint and, and, and the comfort factor that people have um, obviously crossing the border a lot again in, in more normal times. But I think for, from the Jays perspective, bo- both with DJ and George Springer, George of course is from the Northeast. There's comfort there. And I think that the crossing the border would not be a, an issue for either of them at all. And, and I think they would both love representing Toronto and, and Canada and the Jays here in the, in the years to come. Why, why doesn't the Trevor Bauer rumor die? I mean, uh, it, it seems to always just seems to be there, seems to be there, but there's got to be a ton of teams after him. There are. And he, again, is a West Coast guy. To your point, John, the whole industry wants him uh, by and large. I think the, the reason why it doesn't die is what we've covered already from a standpoint of the Jays' need for pitching mm-hmm. and the connection, of course, the original trade to Cleveland uh, and, and just understanding and, and knowing that market well, that, that certainly uh, Mark Shapiro and Ross Atkins know him from that, from that connection, that pathway as well. There's a very good amount of familiarity with Trevor, the person and the pitcher. So um, I think he certainly is a unique personality. We all realize that. But he is someone who I think would engage very well uh, with the organization, with the people of Toronto, with Canadians. And, and I, where he goes, I'm not sure. I, I would still say there are – probably three or four franchises that I would say have a better chance to sign them than the Jays do. But there's certainly somewhere in the, in the top five or 10 possibilities because they are a team that can spend yeah. and they're a team that needs pitching. And I think Trevor wants to win. There's a, there's a lot of competition to be had right now in the American league East. Well, I tell you what, I, I know, I know Bob likes the, the, the position players and, I mean, George Springer is, would be fascinating to me because of wh- who he is and what he does for a team. But if they're spending all this time talking about position players rather than pitchers, I'd be shocked. I mean, pitching, pitching, pitching. That's what the, – w- with the young guys that this well, team has – Well, I agree, has, John. 
I mean, yeah. I mean, you need to. They just have. They just have to. They have to fill that rotation better. And and then I think they're they're a heck of a lot closer than, than even if they don't add a Lindor or a Springer. Well, as usual, you have misrepresented my thought process here. I'm just trying to go through this list. Uh, but I, you know, my I've ne- never misrepresented you, have I? Um, well, you, then you've, you've had a, a unique inability to read my mind because the answer, of course, is pitching, and that's really what you want. And I, I just wonder whether Lindor, Springer, Real Muto, uh, LeMahieu, you name them, are all distractions that the Blue Jays really aren't all that interested in. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, I mean, they have a young team, a, a young infield, um, Morosi. Youngest infield in all of baseball, I think. One of them, uh, yes. All right. And um, do, are, they, are, are they green? Do they have flaws? Yeah. But offensively, they're pretty good. You have three outfielders that are okay um, uh, and some kids. Uh, you, sure, you could upgrade with, um, with Springer or another proven outfielder. But do you need it? No. You've got, you got three young catchers. I don't know how good any of them are, but Kirk demonstrated a unique ability last year. I'd like him to lose about 50 pounds, but uh, whatever. He can hit. Um, do you really need a catcher? I don't know if you really do. And so at mm-hmm. the end of the day, what does it come down to? It come down, comes down pitching. To, to pitching. And you know my philosophy on the bullpen. Uh, that's the last thing I look at. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a pretty girl walks down the street every five minutes, and there's a relief pitcher that walks down the street every five minutes and just grab one and, and hope. And if that one doesn't work out, you know, parachute him out the side of the plane and bring somebody else in. Mm-hmm. That's how the bullpen works for me. Starting pitching, on the other hand, is something that they have a need for. And Trevor Bauer is among those you would concede that would fit that bill, correct? Yeah, and I think, too, one of the reasons why Bauer fits this rotation so well is that you want a, a power right-hander to counterbalance Ryu, Ryu. and Ray from the left side. So, yeah. uh, and, and Ryu pitched great. I think that we can't overstate that Agreed. enough. He was tremendous in his debut season as a Toronto Blue Jay. But you look at the overall rotation, Pearson is, of course, still unproven, promising, but Who unproven. Knows? And then Roark and Stripling are are neither of them are what I would describe as a as a power righty. They're they're both more uh, command type right-handed pitchers. So you don't have in your rotation right now what I would describe as a proven power right-handed starter. There is not that player on this team right now, and that's why, to your point, Bob, that's that's the unique feature this team probably needs to add at some point if you're going to go into Yankee Stadium and and oppose Garrett Cole for example you, you can certainly oppose him with Ryu but you ideally want to be able to line up a staff person in a playoff series and we saw against Tampa Bay the Jays never really had a great chance to win that they series. were outmatched the, the pitching they were outmatched. yeah they, they outmatched is the exact right word they were outmatched they did they did not have the capability to go pitch for pitch with that team. And you have to look at yourself and compare yourself to Tampa Bay and say, how, how do I need to address this and get better? And I, I would say that the, the deficiencies, to Bob's point, were more on the starting pitching side than anything else. So, so but you bring up a really good question, because to me, when you looked how successful Tampa was throughout the playoffs and how the Jays played them in that sweep, um, is this the right year to be doing it? Is this the right time to be upgrading? Should we be waiting until a, a full season, a healthy season, people in the seat season, or so do we, do we just go and invest now, uh, even in the short term? Uh, I, that's to me, that, I think that's a bigger question, particularly when we don't know the fan, financial ramifications of all of major league baseball, of all of sports for that matter. It's a great question, and here's what I would say. Uh, in a vacuum, if, if you were a Blue Jay fan who was going to be very discerning and direct and impartial about your team, you would say this. 
that the times that this organization has been successful, almost always, always, besides the period of time when either the Yankees or the Red Sox are down, one or the other, at least one or the other. Now, if they're both down in a down cycle, then you're really in business. But the reality is you are in the same division competing directly with two of the most powerful organizations in the sport, and then arguably the smartest one in Tampa Bay. So the Jays are, are going up against the Red Sox and Yankees in their full form. Think about like the 07 Red Sox, the Yankees of 09. It's, it's always going to be hard to win. And so you, you have to time up as best you can. And, and as much as you don't ever want to like base your own self-worth on somebody else to, to use the expression of, of life. But I, I also think from a standpoint of strategic spending to John's point, when do I really go and spend? You spend when one of your two biggest adversaries with the ability to spend is in a down cycle. And that's true right now with the, the Red, Red Sox. Sox. Yeah. They are not themselves right now. And not only are they not themselves competitively, but because of all the money they've spent on sale and Evaldi, um, other moves they made, uh, Bogarts, they are not themselves in free agency. A typical offseason is, okay, you're the Red Sox. Who do you want to sign? Go sign them. That's not happening right now. So for that reason, John, the reason why I say, yes, be aggressive if you're the Blue Jays, okay. two reasons. Number one, the underpinning of your club, like if, if Pearson is the guy you think he is, and if Teoscar can keep doing what he's doing, and if Vladdy bounces back, and if Bichette is, is a really like an all-star level player, these are all ifs, but they're legitimate, legitimate they're possibilities. possibilities that a lot of those answers are to the, to the affirmative. So this is a normal expectation. I'm not asking – in a row arc to win 30 games this year. I'm just saying, be, if you are yourself, okay, as a group, these are things that you can do as, a, as an organization. Mm -hmm. Then you say, you know what? Yeah. Add in a Trevor Bauer. Add in a Tomiyuki Sugano from, from Japan. Add in a, a really high-level pitcher. You, you start to think about how the, the club comes together, and, and you nod your head and say, you know what? This, this is a pretty good team. And when you are spending a relatively low amount of money, on guys like Pearson and Guerrero and Biggio and Bichette and Guriel, it leaves you with the ability to, to be selective and spend big on the right players. And the final point I'll make on this particular topic is, to your point, yes, pitching is the greatest need. But do not underestimate the value of Real Muto on the pitching side of the equation. I, you know, Russell Martin was the, was a great signing by Alex at the time that he made it. And one of the reasons was that he gave that young and unproven pitching staff or just somewhat of a transient pitching staff, a little bit more identity and edge and focus. There is something that when you're throwing to a veteran catcher who has right. been in a lot of big games, it just changes you as a pitcher. That's been the case with the out air for a long time. It's been the case. Think about the number of times Russell Martin has been in the playoffs it matters. And Real Muto is a tough, smart, ex-high school wrestler from Oklahoma. He has no presence. And I think that that would really have a big impact on the Jays pitching, too. Uh, we're going to let you go. Uh, oh, I, I, can, I, have, I have two oh. quick questions. Sorry. Two quick questions. Oh, wow. First of all, uh, uh, JP, what, what's going on with the DH in the National League? Have they decided yet? No, uh, that is going to be discussed, uh, I believe, this week. Uh, Ken Davidoff with a report in the New York Post about some reconvening going on between the, the MLBPA and MLB as it relates to the DH. So we should know in the next week to 10 days. Because that, that will affect free agency no as question. well. I mean, yes. when you think about National League teams now trying to go find a big bat that sits on the bench. Right. Someone like a Michael Brantley, for example, who is a – who would be a part-time DH. And by the way, that's a great, we haven't talked about him yet today. Brantley was acquired notably by Mark Shapiro in the CC right. Sabathia deal 12 years ago. And Michael Brantley is one of the great people in the game. Tremendous citizen, great leader, everything. You think about Brantley, if, if you have to trade an outfielder to get a Lindor, if you trade uh, a, a Guriel 
and then you sign a Brantley, and then all of a sudden you've got Brantley and Lindor, a couple of former Cleveland players, of course. That becomes a really intriguing team. Okay. My other question is, we haven't talked since Theo Epstein left Chicago. Where is Theo Epstein going to end up? And is he just going to go into retirement, or just is he, is he going to reinvent himself one more time? I think the, the, the latter. John, he'll do <laughs> something else. Uh, he's, he's someone who, again, a very young man. If he retired today, he is in the Hall of Fame. He ended two of the great curses in American sports history. And he did it in like the same span of 12 years. So mm -hmm. he's a pretty unique person. Uh, I, I think that he's, he has said uh, basically that he would help the commissioner's office potentially deal with a lot of the larger issues of the day, whether it's collective bargaining, whether it's the quality of play on the field. Theo is a deep thinker. He also would be open to getting involved in nonprofits and just community engagement. He's just, he's a very thoughtful person. I've always enjoyed my conversations with him. And he is someone who is true to his word. He has said before that he never wanted to be in any one job for more than 10 years. It's the Bill Walsh idea. Uh, he was true to that with the Boston Red Sox and now true to that with the Chicago Cubs as well. And no chance he goes back to Boston. I mean, that, that's, uh, I, I mean, so. no, no, no relationship I, with John Henry. I, I, I certainly, uh, is it possible? Sure. But I think that for Theo, one of his dreams has always been, if you're going to get back into baseball, be a part owner of a team and really dig in and help build the culture of the club. He loves building organizational culture. Um, a lot of those larger themes of, of, of human connection, if you will. And I think that to be able to do that as a part owner of a team, would be very compelling for him, especially if it's in a city that needs it or a franchise that's going through a reboot or maybe even just starting out. He'd be a great owner, I believe, of, a, of an expansion franchise too. Bob wants to be an owner too, just for the record. I'll I'm done now, Bob. I'll put you in touch I'm with done, Theo. Bob. I'm done, Bob. Uh, well, John said he had two more questions. He asked three and then made a comment at the end of it. So um, this is pretty much part of the course. Quality, quality content, Bob. I used to have control of, uh, of the things that I did in my life. And then, uh, and then Shannon came along <laughs> and it's all gone to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. Uh, Morosi, uh, lovely to see you. Um, you look well. Um, hope the family's all doing great. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll chat with you down the road. We thank you for this. And since we won't uh, see you, uh, we, wish you uh, we wish good luck to the uh, uh, Michigan Wolverines, um, whether they play or don't play. Um, and uh, we wish you and your family a happy holiday season. Thanks, pal. And th they need that luck, by the way, and uh, always a pleasure to speak with both of you. Uh, always love our conversations. Happy happy holidays. Merry Christmas to both of you. Well, JP, just... have, fun, have fun working at the uh, World Junior Hockey Championships for the NHL Network. Uh, I, yeah. I'm sure you'll be, you'll be enjoying a – oh, there we go. A Canada-USA <laughs> final. So. Well, let's uh, let, let's hope that's the case. Some great stories to tell all the way around. Can't wait. And and, uh, and good luck to your Buckeyes, uh, Bob. We won't need <laughs> luck, Morosi. We just need <laughs> Michigan to show up. That's all that needs to happen. Uh, JP Morosi on the podcast today. Uh, have yourself a swell one, and we'll uh, see you on Wednesday. Goodbye. Goodbye.